Act Two, Part One of Charlie's Aunt by Brandon Thomas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two Dedication While there's tea, there's hope. Arthur Wing Pinero. Scene Exterior of Jack Chesney's Rooms, St. Old's College, Oxford. Housepiece showing part of college, with two casement windows on ground floor and two above, at back, with arch right center in continuation. View of quad beyond. Door with knocker and nameplate to rooms, running from housepiece and showing through arch. Low wall joining this to arch, showing chapel down right through arch. Continuation of college up left. Window on first floor and small arch beneath running down stage. Arch down left to garden. Trees right and left and meeting overhead. Yellow sunlight, afternoon small round iron table center, with two first act chairs right and left of it. Victorian wicker or white iron may be substituted if preferred. Rustic chair up center with cushions. Table left of it. Lights full up. Brasset discovered above table center with cigarette box, ash tray, and match box on salver. Places them on table center. Well, we're sailing along. Looks off left. He makes a wonderful old lady, not a doubt about it. With another look. A bit singular to look at, perhaps. But then look at some of your old ladies. Nobody'd believe them possible. And he doesn't seem a bit worse to look at than two or three I could mention hold in very high positions, too. Looks off again. Both the old gents have got their eye on her. Amused. Law, if they only knew. I fancy Sir Francis his favorite, though old Spedigue fancies himself. Chuckles loudly going down left. <laughs> well, college gents'll do anything. <laughs> Enter Jack through arch right center, wearing straw hat. Sees Brasset. Jack coming down in front of table to Brasset, severely. What are you laughing at, eh? Beg pardon, sir. I was thinking of an old aunt of mine. Eh? Brasset, respectfully. A uh, uncle, I mean. Mind your own business, and go and get tea, do you see? Tea. Tea, sir. Yes, sir. Goes up to right center. Out here. Going left. Brasset, turning, surprised. Out here, sir? Yes. Don't stare like that. It's all right. I've got special permission. Oh, beg pardon, sir. Exit through arch right center to rooms. Well, now for Kitty. Where is she? Everything's going on all right at last. Sits left of table center. Babs frightened the life out of me two or three times at lunch, the way he walked into things as if he hadn't had food for a month. But we've got over the worst. Looking off left. All the same, I haven't been able to have my chat yet with Kitty, but now they're all nicely settled down, I've given her a hint to meet me here where we can talk quietly. Enter Charlie quickly, right center, looking off right. Jack rises, turns quickly, hearing footsteps. Here she is. Both raise hats. Meet center. Turn away in disgust. Oh, hang it. I've a most particular appointment here with Kitty, so hook it. But so have I, Jack. With Kitty? No, with Amy. Then we've both made appointments in the same place. Confound it all. What are we to do? Charlie, sadly, crossing left. Well, there are your rooms. Jack, aggressively. Yes, but you're my guest. Suddenly and brightly. Here, come on. Feels in pockets, has nothing. We'll toss for it. They come center. Got any money? Charlie brings out of pockets, knife, string, a key, and a halfpenny. Halfpenny, that's all. Jack takes halfpenny. Sudden death. Tosses. Heads, you and Amy. Tails, me and... Sees Kitty off left. Here she is. Pockets coin. Crosses to left center. Charlie to Jack. Jack, that's all the money I've got. Enter Kitty left. Charlie looks disgusted and goes right center. Oh, Mr. Chesney, there you are. Jack, with a look at Charlie. Yes, I'm here. In fact, 
waiting. Another look at Charlie. Aside to Kitty. I was beginning to fear you wouldn't come. Another look at Charlie, then crosses to him. Why don't you go? Have you no tact? Enter Amy, right center. Charlie to Jack, aside. But what about me and Amy? Amy coming down right to Charlie. Oh, Mr. Wickham, there you are. Yes, I was coming. I, I was waiting. I am here. Going to Amy. Business of looks, etc., between Jack and Charlie. Jack aside. Beastly awkward. With sudden determination. Oh, I say, Charlie, have you shown Miss Spettigue all round the garden? Charlie, cloudily. Yes, Jack, I have. Two or three times. In fact, we've just come from there. Aside to Amy. I wish he'd leave us. Jack, after a pause, to Amy. Uh, lovely garden, isn't it? Yes, I suppose it is. Jack, catching at it. Suppose? Goes behind Amy and Charlie, taking them by the arm to left center. Oh, you haven't half seen it. Charlie, Miss Pettigrew hasn't half seen the garden. Kitty goes up behind table to arch right center, watching with interest and amusement. Take her and show her the roses and primroses and cabbages and things. Amy wanders up, looks off up left. Charlie stopping left center. But, Jack, I... And, Charlie, tell Miss Pettigrew those beautiful lines of yours. To our garden in summer. Charlie, aside to Jack, anxiously. Jack, don't tell her I write poetry. She'll think I'm an awful ass. Amy comes down left again. Jack, turning left to Amy. And don't forget, Miss Pettigrew, tea here in half an hour. Oh, very well, Mr. Chesney. Exit slowly, left. Charlie, following Amy, then turns back. Aside to Jack. But, Jack, the others are in the garden... And it wears the life out of me to see Babs. Kitty comes down center table, sits right. Well, don't. It's a large garden. Keep out of his way. Pushing Charlie off left. Exit Charlie. Jack going behind table center to Kitty. At last, Miss Verdun. My dear Kitty, we are alone. Kitty, teasing. Don't you think it was rather selfish of us, Mr. Chesney, to send them away like that? Well, we tossed for it. Kitty turning, in mock surprise. What? I mean, uh, they'll be much happier together, alone. And it seems as if I could never get five minutes with you safe from some miserable interruption. Indeed, I was beginning to fear you'd think me very rude, neglecting you as I have done. Kitty... An undercurrent of teasing running through all her scene. Oh, no, not at all. I quite understand. I couldn't expect you to devote yourself entirely to me. Rising and crossing left. Indeed, we've had a very pleasant time. And now... Yes, and now? Following her down right of table. I was thinking we ought to be going now. Go? Now? Good gracious, no! Kitty, with elevated eyebrows. Why not? Before I've had a word with you? With enthusiasm. Oh, my dear Miss Verdun, Kitty. Approaching Kitty suddenly, left, about to put an arm round her waist. Kitty draws herself up and a little away in surprise, with a look of comic inquiry. Jack pulls himself up. Won't you sit down? Offers chair left centre, then goes behind centre table. I have something to say to you of importance. Kitty sits left of table centre. Indeed, Mr. Chesney. Yes. Moving round right to front of table centre. You know, Miss Verdun, there are times when a fellow's got to think a lot and think long. I suppose so. Putting right hand unconsciously on table. Jack, centre. And there are times when a fellow mustn't stop to think, or if he does, he'll spoil his chance. Yes. Well then, Miss Verdun, Kitty, my dear Kitty... About to take her hand. Enter Sir Francis, left. Oh, I uh, beg pardon. Jack moves right. Kitty rises to go. No, don't mind me. 
I only wanted a word with my boy here. Kitty, to Sir Francis. Oh, then I'll run into the garden. Sir Francis crosses behind center table, upright. Kitty catches Jack's eye. He crosses to her left. And see the roses and primroses and cabbages and things. Exit left. Jack turning to center. Well, dead. Anything important? Sir Francis coming down right to Jack, center. Yes, Jack, it is. Oh? Uh, what is it? You know I'd do anything to see you get on in the world and make a mark, as I know you will if you get your chance. You needn't tell me all this, Dad. Well, Jack, having thought it over, I've decided that you shall continue the career I originally mapped out for you, and seeing a way out of the difficulty, I've determined to take your advice, my boy, and marry a lady of wealth. I see. You've fallen a victim to the fascinations of some young and lovely— No, Jack, she's not lovely, and I'm afraid she is not over young. But she has one thing in her favor. She has money, which, after all, is the real object in this instance. All right, Dad. As long as you are satisfied, go in and win. And I have to thank you, my boy, for the tip. Thank me for the tip? I don't remember, Dad. Who is she? What's her name? You'll be delighted when I tell you. Yes, well? Can't you guess? No, Dad, I can't. Dona Lucia d'Alva Dorez. Slapping Jack on the shoulder and crossing left center. What? Goes right center. Aside. The deuce! Turning to Sir Francis. Dad, this is impossible. Impossible? Why, you yourself suggested it. And for your sake, my lad, I'm going to do it. But, Dad, you can't. Sir Francis, with a look off left. Can't? Why not? Gravely, moving a little nearer to Jack, center. Is there anything against the lady's uh, reputation? No, but you mustn't. You can't. Mustn't? Can't? Why, Jack, what a boy you are. Didn't you tell me to go to the hotel, change my things, put a flower in my buttonhole? Lifting lapel of coat to indicate carnation. And by George, Jack, I believe the flower's done the trick. She gave it away, Dad. My dear boy. Slight nudge. She's explained all that. Goes upstage, left center, and returns downstage, very self-satisfied. Jack, aside. This is horrible. Aloud. But, Dad, circumstances have altered since then. Sir Francis, coming center. In what way? You know you're too good. You're not the man to be thrown away like this. Sir Francis, hand on Jack's shoulder. Say no more, my boy. Your consideration for me settles it. Crosses right. It will put you forward years. Had she been young and lovely, she wouldn't have looked at me. As it is, I flatter myself that she's taken rather a fancy to me, and as for old Spetagu, in spite of his marked attentions, I don't think he has the ghost of a chance with me. Goes up right center. Jack, aside in horror, going down left center. Old Spetagu, attentions great. Heavens, what are we doing? Turning aloud. Uh, Dad! Sir Francis, by Arch. So wish me luck, Jack, wish me luck. Uh, take time, Dad. Uh, think it over. Sir Francis, heroically. Think it over. That's not the way an old soldier makes love. Briskly. I'm going into your rooms to get myself a rattling good spanking brandy and soda to bring me up to the mark. Exit Sir Francis to rooms. Jack crossing right. Great Scott, what's the young monkey doing? Enter Charlie left, quickly. Charlie crossing to Jack, right center. Jack, Jack, I wish you'd speak to Babs. He's carrying on disgracefully. He's taken Amy away from me and gone off round the garden with her. Well, that's nothing to what's going on here. Cork pops loudly off in rooms. Both turn. Charlie listens, surprised. Hear that? 
Yes. What is it? My dad getting himself a rattling good spanking brandy and soda. Brandy and soda? What for? To propose. To Babs. That's all. Goes down right. Charlie goes center. I knew something awful would come of this. We shall be found out and disgraced. How could you let it go on? Jack coming center. Well, don't blame me. It was the fault of your muddle-headed aunt not knowing her own mind and leaving us in the lurch. Crossing. I could strangle her. Charlie following Jack left, helplessly. Uh, what shall we do? We must find Babs and put him up to the governor's game. Charlie dazed. Find Babs? But Jack! Come on. We can go round the garden different ways until we've got him. Pushing Charlie across. Charlie turning to Jack. But Jack, can't you end this horrible? Oh, shut up. We must keep our heads now or we'll ruin everything. Come on. Pushes Charlie off left. Exits after Charlie left. Re-enters Sir Francis from rooms, wiping mustache after his drink. Sir Francis, coming down right center. Now, I'm ready for anybody or anything. Looks at watch. Why doesn't she come? Crossing left center. I didn't tell the dear boy, particularly when he raised objections, but she promised to meet me here in ten minutes. And time's up. Time's up. Looking off left. Enter Spedicue through arch, up right center. Comes down looking off right. Does not see Sir Francis. Sir Francis hears step. Raising hat, turning center. Oh, my dear Don. Raising their hats, they meet center and turn away abruptly. Sir Francis aside. That old fool, Spedicue, and with my flower in his coat. To Spedicue. Are you, uh, looking for anybody? No. Looks off right. Sir Francis aside. What's he hanging about here for? Aloud, struggling to be civil. Are you in want of anything? Light cigarette out of box on table center. Sits. Spedigue, right. No, I was only thinking it was a very lovely afternoon. Perhaps you haven't seen the garden. It's looking very beautiful. You ought to give it a good look before you go. I will. Blowing smoke. Before I go. Spedigue looks off right again. Sir Francis aside. What is he stopping here for? Aloud. Have a cigarette? No, thank you. I never smoke in the daytime. Aside. Why does he remain? Looking at his watch. She promised to meet me here in ten minutes, and time's up. Time's up. Going up arch to right center. Sir Francis aside. What's he stopping for? I must tell him to go. Spedigue aside. I wish I could think of something to get rid of him. Sir Francis aloud, rising, strolls right. Well, as you are not smoking... Oh, don't mind me. Crossing behind table to up left, unconcernedly. Don't mind me. Sir Francis turning to Spedigue. I was only thinking, perhaps it would be well if you rejoined the ladies in the garden. Uh, they might think it rude, both of us being away. Sits right of table, holding up his cigarette. Spedigue, coming down left. Perhaps so, perhaps so. Aside, at left entrance. She's in the garden. Exit, left. Sir Francis, rising. Well, she doesn't appear to be coming. I think I'll go and have another. Going up right center. Enter Jack, left. I say, Dad, you haven't seen Donna Luzia, have you? Sir Francis, coming down right center. No, Jack, I've not. Jack, aside. That's fortunate. I'm waiting for her here. Waiting for her? Here? Yes, I've an appointment with her. I didn't tell you before, Jack, but she's due. In fact, she's overdue. So get out, my boy. Get out. Looks off right. Jack, aside. They mustn't meet till I've seen him. Aloud. 
now i come to think of it dad i saw her only a moment ago oh where coming center jack pointing off left in the garden in the garden crossing left hurriedly hang it i've just sent old spedagu there exit sir francis left i know babs isn't there but where on earth has he got to crossing right enter charlie up left jack hearing steps turns to charlie well have you found him charlie coming down center dejectedly hat on back of head no i haven't do you no and i've looked all over the place for him so have i and the worst of it he's got amy with him it's a shame i'll kill the little monkey when i get hold of him charlie catching sight of lord fancourt and amy off right swings jack round facing right look at him isn't it too bad enter lord fancourt and amy together right arm in arm amy crosses to left of charlie oh mr wickham there you are did you think you'd lost us yes i i'm afraid i did moves with amy to centre jack right centre aside to lord fancourt where have you been with that girl you fool nowhere stop where you are i've something to tell you oh have you flounces round kicking out skirt backwards goes up to arch right centre charlie has miss pettigrew seen the chapel aside to charlie as he passes him across to right take her away while i tell babs aloud walking between them to arch right you must see the chapel it's an awfully pretty chapel exit amy right lord fancourt comes down left of jack by arch right charlie about to exit turns angrily jack i'll punch his hat if he does it again lord fancourt comes aggressively to charlie jack between charlie irritated strikes down at lord fancourt over jack's shoulder lord fancourt tips charlie's hat off jeeringly with his closed fan jack hustles charlie off right jack turning savagely stalks lord fancourt with long strides and without speaking to left lord fancourt backing before jack to left what the deuce do you mean by this game what game you promised to help us well i'm doing my best doing your best your business was to look after those two old chaps and here you are exasperated turns and strides away right but i've no wish to argue lord fancourt follows closely in silence striding in step behind jack speaks when right centre no i shouldn't argue if i were you listen i want to put you on your guard on my guard oh thank you yes my dad's going to propose to you oh is he that's all right stop suddenly centre well i'm not going to marry him for you or anybody else i'll see you hanged first jack going to him of course not you idiot all you've got to do is to be calm and refuse him calm and refuse him but a proposal puts anyone in a flutter you know that all you've got to do is to remember that you're a real old lady how the dickens am i to remember that i'm a real old lady lift skirt and petticoat together showing trousers to knees with my trousers on jack pulling down lord fancourt's skirt never mind your trousers looking off left look out here's the dad i'm off going up to arch right centre lord fancourt following up after jack right centre and grabbing him yes but what am i to say looking toward left anxiously i've never been proposed to before jack in archway oh say he's taken you by surprise but whatever you do mind you refuse him oh yes i'll refuse him exit jack through arch to right lord fancourt hides between arch and door to rooms sir francis enters left looking at watch really it's too bad crosses right looks off she made the proposition herself crossing up stage to left it was a definite proposition of her own well coming down left ladies are proverbial unpunctual but 
Lord Fancourt, peeping round corner, appears in archway right centre, holding up finger with fichu, neckcloth, archly to Sir Francis. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Sir Francis turns, sees Lord Fancourt, raises hat. Lord Fancourt looks coyly at Sir Francis and swings end of fichu gaily round and round. Sir Francis, putting on hat again. Ah, dear Dona Lucia, here you are. I was beginning to be afraid. Crossing right. And popped into the garden to find you. Lord Fancourt, with long strides, steals quickly across to upper left entrance, and is nearly off as Sir Francis says, It's so good of you to come. Turns. Lord Fancourt, seeing Sir Francis turn, stops up left. His attempt to bolt is frustrated. Sir Francis sees Lord Fancourt at upper left entrance. Won't you sit down? Lord Fancourt sits left of center table. Sir Francis aside. By Jove, got her at last. Now for the plunge. I'll begin with a compliment. Looks at Lord Fancourt, then away again. I wonder what's her real age. However, a woman's never too old for a compliment. So here goes. Coming to table. Clears throat. <clears throat> Lord Fancourt clears throat, too. No, no, Lucia. You'll pardon the rude metaphor of an old campaigner, I'm sure. But to meet you today for the first time, as I have done, is to me like a lonely traveler coming across some uh, bright little floweret. Their eyes meet, indicating left. By the wayside. Lord Fancourt looks left, then to Sir Francis. Do you mean me? Yes, Dona Lucia, yes. Goes down right, aside. By Georgia, that's a good start. Lord Fancourt, aside. What am I to say to that, I wonder? Aloud. Oh, yes. I think that's very nice and very kind of you. Sir Francis turns away right, aside. By George, she looks anything between fifty and a hundred. Jack appears in arch at back, right center. Shakes fist at Lord Fancourt, who cocks a snook at him, unseen by Sir Francis. As Sir Francis turns, Lord Fancourt converts snook into stroking front hair, looking innocently at Sir Francis. Jack retires right, unseen by Sir Francis. Sir Francis, aside. Well, I've put myself to it, so I must come to the point. <clears throat> what? Again? Sir Francis going to right of table. Aloud, bluffly. Dona Lucia, do you know what a man longs for when he's lonely, desolate, and wretched? A drink? Sir Francis goes down right, aside. What a woman doesn't help one bit. Up to right of table. Aloud. No, Dona Lucia. This is what he longs for. He longs to plant in his own heart that bright little floweret. I know. Uh, by the wayside. Pointing left. That one. Does he really? Sir Francis heartily. Yes, Dona Lucia, yes. With lover-like intention. And I have come all the way from India to find that little floweret. You must be tired. Indicating chair. Take a chair. Thank you. Sits left of table, center. Puts hat, crown downwards, on table. It's a long way, Dona Lucia. Oh, quite a long walk. But I have found it. Then why don't you wear it in your buttonhole? Pointing. Ah, uh, will you let me, or will it be given away to another, as you did before? Ah, yes, I remember. I was a naughty girl this morning. Putting corner of fichu in mouth, shaking it to and fro coyly, and putting right hand unconsciously on table. Sir Francis looking away, cautiously. But dear Lucia... Places hand on that of Lord Fancourt's for a second, and giving it a pat. Then removes it, and looks off right again. Lord Fancourt taking hand off table, aside. He's getting on. The floweret, I mean, must sit at the head of my table, walk by my side, dwell in my heart forever. Places right hand on heart, and with left hand slightly moves hat looks away right. Lord Fancourt, rising and looking quickly into hat, sits again, aside. He's going to show me a conjuring trick. 
Sir Francis, bluffly again. But I'll waste no more words. I'll come to the point with a soldier's bluntness. Will you be my wife? Quick gasp from Lord Fancourt. Will you be my little floweret? Well, you see... Then remembering Jack's words... You've taken me so much by surprise. Then I may hope? I'm afraid not. No, don't hope. I wouldn't hope if I were you. I beg pardon, Dona Lucia. Do I understand? Rises. I must refuse you. The fact is, I am another's. Another's? Turns away, right. I say, don't be downhearted. I'll tell you what I'll do if you like. Sir Francis turning eagerly. Yes, yes. I will be a sister to you. A sister? Only a sister? Only a sister? Nothing more. And no words of mine can alter your decision? I'm afraid not. You see, I'm in a more peculiar position than I could ever explain. I am a woman with a history. Then it is quite useless our prolonging this interview. Goes to back of table. And you will accept my regrets and... Picks up hat and goes down left. Apologies for ever having broached the subject. Oh, certainly. Any time you're passing. Sir Francis puts on hat. Aside. Refused. What a relief. I'm sorry, though, for my boy's sake. Sir Francis exits, left. Enter Jack, upright center, from right. Lord Fancourt, rising. Well, here's a nice position. Jack, meeting Lord Fancourt, center. You fool! What did you want to make a fool of my dad like that for? Lord Fancourt, rapidly. I didn't make a fool of the fool, you fool. Did you hear what he called me? Yes, a floweret. Yes, by the wayside. That's a nice thing, isn't it? Why didn't you cut him short and refuse him at once? I couldn't refuse him until he proposed. No lady could. Why, I shall find myself in the divorce court before I know where I am. Looks off, left. Sees Spedigue, crossing quickly in front of Jack. Look out, here's old Spedigue. Turning to Jack again, pulls up sleeve, which shows shirt cuff, shaking fist. I shall land him on. I know I shall. I'm off takes up skirts and runs off quickly through archway down right. Jack in front of center table. Enter Spedigue left. Spedigue to Jack as he enters. Ah, Mr. Chesney, have you seen... Sees Lord Fancourt off through archway down right. Ah. Absently pushes Jack, who sits suddenly on table center. Spedigue exits hurriedly by archway right. What the deuce did he boat like that for? Anyhow, they don't wreck my future happiness. Rising looks off right. I must find Kitty. Why couldn't Charlie's aunt behave like a lady and turn up as she promised? Going left. Instead of giving us all this trouble. I hate the sight of her before I've even seen her. Exit left. A pause. Donna Lucia off. First door to the left. Thank you very much. Enter Donna Lucia, with open sunshade framing her head, and Ella, by archway right center, from right. Donna Lucia is a well-preserved, beautiful, kindly woman of middle age, with a young face, but gray hair. She has a keen sense of humor, and is capable of taking command of any situation. On no account sentimental, but with a deep feeling of real sentiment in her nature. This part should be played gaily, with a light, firm touch of comedy, amusement dominating her performance, and she dominating the situations from now on. Wears afternoon summer dress and coat to match, hat and gloves, and carries several visiting cards in her purse bag. Ella Delahaye is a young, pretty, unaffected little girl of seventeen or twenty. Also has a sense of humor and high spirits. This part should not be played either sloppily or sentimentally. Wears summer dress and hat, and carries purse bag and gloves. Donna Lucia looks round, then crosses behind table to left. The first door to the left, the man said, Ella. 
Ella at door upright center. Yes, here it is. Reads on door. Mr. John Chesney. To Donna Lucia. Shall I knock? Yes, do, my dear. Ella knocks. Donna Lucia, coming down left center, thoughtfully. Chesney. Hmm. The name sounds familiar. To Ella. Why couldn't my nephew remain in his rooms and not compel me to follow him about like this? Ella, coming right center. You telegraphed to say you couldn't come. Donna Lucia, smiling. I know, my dear. And then you changed your mind. Donna Lucia, moving to left of table. Yes, for about the first time in my life. Why? Ah. Oh some vague desire to see him without his knowing knock again dear closes sunshade ella knocks ella coming down right the porter said they might all be in the garden with childlike enthusiasm ah oh, i could roam about these old places all day isn't it all beautiful looking about excitedly <laughs> dream away ella I shall wait till someone comes. Sits left of table. Ella, right center. Looking round, thrilled. Quickly. Oh, to live among these leafy shades, ancient spires and sculptured nooks, like silent music. <sighs> A scholar's fairyland. Donna Lucia, with quiet humor. <laughs> but to one poor sublunary being not quite so young as she used to be a little fatiguing ella behind right chair of centre table impetuously to donna lucia and how lovely it must be by moonlight where the shadows have no sudden fears but are only folds in the mantle of sleep and all is peace and the silver bells chime to the sentinel angel of the night who smiles to heaven and whispers back, All's well, sweet bells, all's well. <laughs> you fanciful little woman, but what has put all this about angels and so forth into your head today? Ella going behind table to center, absently. Oh, I don't know. Donna Lucia, teasingly. Oh, I think I can trace back all the little byways and slyways of thought that generally lead in one direction. Ella going quickly to left of Donna Lucia and kneels. Oh no, it's all so sweet here. Donna Lucia mischievously. So it was there, by moonlight, seen from the bridge of a certain yacht, the rippling sea, the blue night and brilliant stars <laughs> you see how i remember your words and a certain someone who told you as you listened to the chime of the ship's bell that you looked like the angel of the watch he was a flattering tongued person that someone what was his name again ella looking down shyly i've told you so often donna lucia looking straight ahead with a smile <laughs> lord fancourt babbley fraction of a pause to ella but i don't want your mind fixed on these things my dear why i'd almost forgotten to tell you i've invested your poor father's money for you and thanks to his forethought for his little girl he has rendered you independent for life and what is worse independent of me ella thoughtfully independent but you won't be ella ella affectionately no for i've grown to love the little orphan i met in such grief in a strange land so much that i am not independent of her so let's make a bargain Put that dreadful evidence of my dependence aside and let it grow and be my little girl and call me auntie, will you? Ella, rising and kissing Donna Lucia. Yes, auntie, yes. Going behind chair, right center. 
slight pause how did your poor father come to have so large a sum of money by him like that i thought he'd lost it all ella diffidently papa won it at cards won it at cards when ella looking down during his illness from whom ella reluctantly from lord fancourt beverley oh is lord beverley a gambler too no donna lucia seeing the position and smiling to herself oh slight pause ella eagerly but auntie if we ever meet may i give it back <laughs> i don't think he'd take it why not it seems to me he took too much trouble to lose it but i'm not going to speak for him i don't want you ever to leave me pause ah oh, my dear <laughs> you've set me thinking now have i what about ella crosses back to left of donna lucia oh all about someone who oh do tell me Niels. <laughs> it was before i went abroad to brazil i was very young and <laughs> he was very shy he never called me the angel of the watch but he did get as far as a stammering compliment and a blush and then and then donna lucia with a mock heroic wave of the hand <sighs> then he was ordered off with his regiment ella with slight diffidence without ever without ever with finality ella regretfully oh auntie sits back on heels looking up at donna lucia tiny pause donna lucia softly reminiscently with slight touch of sentiment almost like a young girl it was at a dance the evening before he went away ella keeps same tone as donna lucia so as not to break her memory and you've never loved anyone since donna lucia smiling quietly <laughs> i was a sentimental young lady in those days what was his name auntie frank chesney rises recollecting with quick glance towards door how strange ella rises upright centre enter sir francis left donna lucia turning to sir francis oh i'm afraid we're intruding oh not at all raising his hat and crossing with a slight bow right the college grounds are open to everyone crosses right i am so to speak at home here merely because these are my son's rooms turns to donna lucia indicating rooms with a step towards right centre mister sir francis stopping down right chesney ella goes quietly up left turns and watches scene and you pardon my asking are you or rather were you lieutenant frank chesney sir francis interested i was and you don't remember me i acknowledge with regret that i have um no recollection whatever but sounding as though he wished he had <laughs> it must be more than twenty years since turning to ella who has come down left centre sir francis a little let down by the time and trying to recall twenty years donna lucia aside to ella with mock concern he doesn't remember me taking out several cards from card case and looking them through twenty years is a long time auntie sir francis facing audience downright aside twenty years where was the regiment then i wonder donna lucia reads card mrs beverly smythe aside to ella everyone's card but my own of course puts it under case to sir francis 
then you've forgotten the day you first embarked for india no but you've forgotten the evening before sir francis with a smile of recollection no donna lucia holding out hand then sir francis slowly surprised and delighted lucy takes off hat with left hand going to donna lucia and taking her hand good gracious ella goes up left turns and watches scene sympathetically sir francis growing quietly excited and to think that at that very dance um, but you don't remember that of course let's go her hand puts on hat again no no because you never knew but that night by george i nearly made you an avowal that ah uh... looking at her admiringly and we've never met in all that time nearly sees her pretended dismay well over twenty years we'll say donna lucia smiling <sighs> i'm afraid so ella comes down left centre i remember the dance perfectly you were in white tied up with blue donna lucia laughing to ella <laughs> tied with blue like a chocolate box sir francis with enthusiasm you must see my son he's a splendid fellow turning and going a little upstage these are his rooms or rather he has lent them to a college friend a young fellow named wycan returning right centre donna lucia interested yes wycan who is entertaining some ladies uh, two young ladies donna lucia smiles at ella and his aunt donna lucia puzzled turns to sir francis his aunt a lady from brazil donna lucia astonished looks front from brazil yes donna lucia d'alverdores i must introduce you goes up right a step or two ella quickly aside to her auntie what does he mean sir francis returns down right donna lucia aside to ella wait a minute my dear turning to sir francis do i understand you to say that donna lucia d'alvadores is here actually here in the garden with look off right or was five minutes ago do you know her i i've heard of her turning centre aside half to ella and half to herself shall i stay and see this out or return to town and absently fingering card may i trouble you holding out hand for card donna lucia with quick look at sir francis gives wrong card <sighs> certainly sir francis reading mrs beverly smythe crossing behind table to left ella going to donna lucia auntie Shh. sir francis down left i'll find donna lucia and the boys or perhaps you wouldn't mind coming into the garden to them donna lucia picking up sunshade by table crossing ella to centre with pleasure i am quite curious to see them to sir francis introducing my niece miss della hay how do you do er uh, colonel sir francis slight bow sir francis chesney at left entrance come ella ella and donna lucia exit left sir francis at left entrance replaces hat on head enthusiastically ah jack my boy if that had been donna lucia things might have been very different exits left after them End of Act Two, Part One. Act Two, Part Two of Charlie's Aunt by Brandon Thomas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Part Two. 
enter Lord Fancourt right, runs rapidly across stage, holding up skirts in front, only so that Spedigue following does not see trousers, and exits left. Enter Spedigue right, runs across stage, out of breath, top hat wobbling perilously, and exits left, following Lord Fancourt. Enter Brasset from house, stops in archway with tablecloth, sees Lord Fancourt and Spedigue, comes down and looks off left after them. What's his lordship up to with the old gent now? Looks as if they were having a game of some kind. I think it's very dangerous running about like that. I'm not sure I didn't catch sight of his lordship's trousers. Takes cigarette box off center table and puts it on table at back. Enter Jack and Kitty, right. Jack, entering left of Kitty, talking ardently. And now here we are at last. No one here, and I can speak to you. Kitty, my dear Kitty. Brasset, behind center table, lays cloth. Kitty sees Brasset, aside to Jack. But Jack, look! Kitty crosses to left, behind Brasset. Jack turns, sees Brasset, goes to him right, aside. What are you doing, Brasset? Laying the cloth for tea, sir. Go away! But you gave orders, sir. Go slowly behind Jack, to right. Kitty drops down left center. Put it back for half an hour. Quick, man. Can't you see I'm engaged? Brasset, right center. Jack, center, standing behind table. Brasset, looking from Kitty to Jack. Really, sir? Looks at Kitty, then to Jack. I congratulate you. Kitty turns away left, to hide laughter. Busy, confound you. Get out and don't come back. Quickly puts teacloth over Brasset's head, pushing him off through door to rooms. Brasset exits to rooms. Kitty goes left of center table and sits. Jack, coming behind table to Kitty. And now, my dear Kitty. <laughs> yes, Jack, you've said that before. Now don't interrupt me. I go straight at most things, and I'm not going to hesitate over this. Is it that you attach so much importance to it, or is it that you don't care what you do? It's both mixed. So, Kitty, my dear Kitty. Kitty, still chaffingly, looking up at him. Yes, Jack? Ah, Kitty, do be serious. In a few hours you'll be hundreds of miles away, and it may be years before we meet again. Unless... Unless... Kitty, still mischievously. Unless? Another upward look at him. What? Jack, swallowing it. Will you listen? Kitty, with mock helplessness. I can't help myself. Jack sits right of table, seriously. I've told you how my father intended me for Parliament and all that. Yes? Well, he tells me now that for the next few years I shall have to give up all that and earn my own living. Well, that will do you no harm, Jack. Jack, brightly, much encouraged. No, that's how I look at it. I've done well up here. I've worked hard, and work tells wherever you are. So, I intend to turn to and come out all right one way or another. Rising, going down right. Aside. I've broken the ice at last. Goes up quickly to arch, right center. Kitty, aside, quickly. The dear fellow. Jack, aside, looking off to right. I hope they'll keep away. Kitty chaffingly over shoulder to Jack, upright. I'm sure I wish you every success. Jack coming to back of table. Of course, in time I shall be all right, but the question is, will you wait? Wait? Looking full at him. What for? Jack, disconcerted, drawing to right of table, quickly and nervously. No, I beg pardon, I didn't mean that. Oh, you didn't mean it? Jack, bravely. Uh, no, what I really mean is that, before I say anything further, I should like you to understand... His courage melting. ...what I've been telling you. Kitty, after a little pause. Oh, yes. Cruelly. What was that? Jack sits right of table. Well, to be practical and lay everything fairly before you, my position in life will be something in... Uh, the city. Uh, thanks. Uh, my home... Uh... Suburban. 
Thanks. Exactly. Transit. Bus or rail? My personal income. Small. My extra income. Precarious. But under certain conditions, my fears would be nil and my hopes tremendous. Enthusiastically. Rising. Now you know all. Sits. That's how I stand. Kitty pointedly, nodding to chair. Oh, that's how you stand. Jack rising. Oh, Kitty. <laughs> Goes right, looks off. Aside quickly. It's my duty to tell her all. Going up right center to Arch, looking off right. Kitty aside, quickly. The dear fellow. Jack looking off right, shaking fist. Aside. I'll kill anyone who comes now. Kitty affecting a kindly but unconcerned interest. Well, I hope those happy conditions will be realized to your heart's content. Jack coming down to left of Kitty, sincerely. Kitty, my dear Kitty, they will never be realized without you. Kitty rises, goes a little to center. Without me? Jack draws back apologetically, goes down left. Now you're vexed with me. You hate the city, you despise the suburbs, you loathe buses. Kitty reprovingly and affectionately, turning, facing Jack left. Why should you say that, Jack? Jack turning in wonder. Kitty. Kitty in front of center table. As if I hadn't the heart to do what thousands of better girls than I have done. Jack a step towards her, surprised. Kitty. Kitty sitting on edge of table. As if I couldn't guess all the happy fun that is to be got out of cooking and mending and ministering to the wants and happiness of the man who will work and strive for the woman he loves. Jack, hopefully, going a step nearer. Then, Kitty? Kitty rising, holding out hand. Try me, Jack, for I love you dearly. Jack, taking both her hands. You do, Kitty? You do? As much? Teasing again. As much as you love me, Jack. Jack exultantly. Kitty. Going to kiss her. Kitty facing Jack laughingly. <laughs> My dear Kitty. My dear Kitty. You're a brick. Jack puts his arms round Kitty and kisses her. Kitty then runs up right center, looks off, and Jack goes down left center. Jack exultantly. I've done it. Facing audience down left. I've done it. In spite of the lot of them. Goes up left. Walks up and down delightedly. Kitty turns, and seeing Jack walking up and down, she laughs. Kitty comes down right center. But what about my guardian, Mr. Spettigue? Jack, coming center, puts arm round Kitty. Both sit on table center. Jack, decisively. I'll see him at once. Kitty alarmed. No, that won't do. Won't do? No, I must have his consent in writing. In writing? Why? So that he can't retract. Crossing left. You don't know him as well as I do. Now, there's only one person who can get that written consent for us, so be a good boy and send her to me at once. Crossing Jack to left. Jack rising. What, Amy? Kitty returning left center. No, Charlie's aunt, Donna Lucia. Jack staggered. Donna Lucia? But, Kitty... Now don't ask questions, there's a good boy, but send her to me at once while I find Amy. Exits left. Jack crosses right. Where are we now? This can't go on. Looks off right. Enter Charlie left, running. Bangs Jack on the back. I've done it. Jack, I've done it. Done what? Meeting Charlie right center. I've let the cat out of the bag and told her everything. You fool. Backing Charlie to center, holding him by coat. What for? Told her what? Charlie surprised. Did I allow her? Jack with relief, letting him go. Oh, is that all? Charlie, changing tone. Yes, but Jack, she's gone off to find Donna Lucia to get her uncle's consent. We shall be in the dickens of a mess yet. Well, keep cool, man, keep cool. We're all right up to now. We're all right up to now. Both coming down right center, beyond table. Enter Lord Fancourt left, running. No fan this entrance. Doubles between boys right center, 
and hides behind center arch, left side of it. Boys, catching sight of Spedigue left, go up right center, trying to look unconcerned. Enter Spedigue left. Spedigue strolls across stage, humming, out of tune. When and how shall I earliest meet her? What are the words she'll first say to me? Exits right. Boys watch Spedigue off over their shoulders, then cross to arch left, and bring Lord Fancourt down. Jack right, Charlie left of Lord Fancourt. You'll drag us into awful disgrace. Lord Fancourt between them center. And a damn good job, too. You don't know the things he keeps on saying to me. Jack abusively. He who? Why, my mash, old Spettigue. Jack impatiently. Well, what does he say? Yes, what does he say? Lord Fancourt with a look at Charlie. No, Charlie's too young. Pushes Charlie away, whispers to Jack. Charlie, looking sulky, tries to hear. I get out, man, that's nothing. No, but it's very embarrassing. Look how well I get on with the girls. Yes, confound you, too well. Oh, do I? Kicks skirt out of his way as he turns. Goes up and puts brooch on table, back. Then leans against arch right, feet crossed. Charlie with sudden frenzy. Jack, I can live this lie no longer. Sits left of table, center. Jack, shouting aggressively. Now don't start that. Some lies have got to be lived. What for? Jack, savagely. To save confessing them, you duffer. Sits right of table. Charlie, despairingly. I wish to goodness you bring it all to an end. So do I. I want a drink. Jack, working himself up. To Charlie, but spoken at Lord Fancourt. We'd be all right if that donkey would only be reasonable and behave like a lady. I know all that. But he can't. He doesn't know how. As it is, the selfish idiots ruining and spoiling everything. Lord Fancourt listens to this abuse, looking hurt. Takes off Fichu and flings it down in silence. I wish we'd asked Freddy Peel now. At any rate, Freddy Peel would have stood by us like a man. Lord Fancourt undoing dress. We were fools to trust him. The selfish little beast. Lord Fancourt lets dress slip to the ground and steps over it. When you think of all the miseries he's put us to. Lord Fancourt takes off petticoat and steps over that, looking injured with hands in his pockets. I feel so infernally indignant. I could wring his head off. Lord Fancourt, downright, turns back to audience, stands grinning, hands in trouser pockets, facing boys, defying them. He is now in shirt sleeves, waistcoat, and trousers, but still wearing wig, bonnet, and mittens. Charlie seeing Lord Fancourt. Look, look at him now. Lord Fancourt bolts through archway upright center, followed by Jack, who picks up petticoat and fichu. Charlie picks up dress round back of scene. Re-enter right after a second, followed by Spedigue. Exit upright center again. They re-enter down right, still running, same order, cross stage to up left. Exit Lord Fancourt up left as Spedigue re-enters right. Jack and Charlie stop up left. They quickly hide, dress, etc. behind their backs. Spedigue to Jack breathlessly. Ah, Mr. Chesney, have you seen Donna Lucia? Jack and Charlie point off left. In the garden. Exit Spedigue left. Jack and Charlie up left and return dragging Lord Fancourt down center. Charlie right of him, Jack left. Lord Fancourt center throwing them off. Here, you chaps. I won't stand this any longer. Let's Charlie have a go. Charlie goes down right. Jack puts Fichu half in left coat pocket, gets petticoat ready to put over Lord Fancourt's head. Lord Fancourt puts his hands in pockets in sulky refusal. Jack drops skirt over Lord Fancourt's head and tries to fasten it round his waist while standing behind him, finding it won't meet, comes forward to see the cause and makes Lord Fancourt take his hands out of his pockets. Take your hands out of your pockets. Lord Fancourt does so, and Petticoat falls to the ground. Jack pulls it up. Lord Fancourt fastens it. Here are your braces. 
Jack hands right elastic brace to Lord Fancourt, who lets it slip, hitting Jack in the eye. Jack gives brace again. Lord Fancourt fastens it while Jack takes left brace, turns toward left entrance, looking off anxiously. Brace springs out of his hand and hits Lord Fancourt. Jack grins. Lord Fancourt goes down left. Jack crosses right to Charlie, picks up bottom of dress, which Charlie is holding by the shoulders with sleeves hanging down. Lord Fancourt, turning, sees them holding dress horizontally, runs and dives into it, then shakes Charlie by the hand as his arm comes out of right sleeve. When Lord Fancourt gets his collar fastened, Jack speaks. Just when we want old Spettigue in his best humour, you go and risk everything by this fool of a game. Lord Fancourt doing up dress. What fool of a game? I'm not going to marry old Spettigue. I could never be happy with a man like that. You know, Babs, if it was your girl, we'd do anything for you. Where's my antimacassar? Jack putting Fichu round Lord Fancourt. And all you think of is running after our girls, confound you. Charlie, am I all right behind? Straightening down his things, turns back to audience, and gives his skirt a final flirt out behind with both hands. All go upright center, as though to exit. Charlie looks left. Look out, here are the girls. They stop. Lord Fancourt crosses left behind table to left center. Enter Kitty and Amy, left. Kitty, going to left center by table. Oh, Donna Lucia, we've been looking for you everywhere. Indicating chair left of table to Jack, taking Lord Fancourt's arm and leading him down left center. Amy and I want so much to speak to you. Amy, having taken Lord Fancourt's left arm. We're in a difficulty. A difficulty? Charlie goes left of Amy. Jack brings chair from left of table and places it behind Lord Fancourt, left center, then goes to right of Kitty. And we want you to be an angel. Aside to Jack. Now, Jack, do go away. Yes, Charlie, do go away. Lord Fancourt to boys. Go away. They want me to be an angel. Jack and Charlie go up left center. Kitty kneels right of Lord Fancourt. Amy left. Kitty to Lord Fancourt. You know Amy's uncle, Mr. Spettigue, is my guardian, and under my father's will gets nearly all my money if I marry without his consent. And you know Jack and Kitty are in love with each other, and Jack's lost all his money or something. Kitty getting quicker. For years and years. Lord Fancourt looks at each in turn. Amy and quicker. And Kitty wants you to... No, wait a moment, Amy, dear. Lord Fancourt to Amy. Yes, wait a moment, Amy, dear places his arm round Amy. It's her turn now. Jack restrains Charlie from punching Lord Fancourt. Amy to Kitty. Now it's your turn. Lord Fancourt to Kitty. Yes, now it's your turn. Places his arm round Kitty. Charlie prevents Jack from hitting Lord Fancourt. And Amy and Charlie are in love with each other too, but you don't object, do you? Rises. Oh no, my dears. Amy rises. Kitty and Amy together, kissing Lord Fancourt. You, you all dear, dear. You dear, dear thing. thing. They go up together and look off up left. Jack and Charlie come down right and left of Lord Fancourt and punch him. Kitty and Amy return to right and left of Lord Fancourt. Kitty to Jack. Now, Jack, do go away. Amy to Charlie. Yes, go away, Charlie. Lord Fancourt between girls. Yes, go away. We three girls want to be alone. Jack and Charlie go up left center. Kitty kneels right, Amy left as before. Charlie aside to Jack. I must end this. I must do something. Well, go and look after the tea. Exit Charlie, right center to rooms. I must bring them all and stop this. Exit hurriedly up left. Kitty to Lord Fancourt. Now first... You know where we left off, don't you? Yes. You're all in love and want to get married. Well, ah, uh, yes. And we want Uncle's consent. And yours. And we want you to be an angel and do it. An angel and do it? Do what? Kitty, a little anxiously. Why, get Mr. Spettigue's consent. For both of us. Oh, for both of you. Yes, 
First, you see, you'll give your consent to Charlie and Amy, won't you? Lord Fancourt to Amy. Oh, yes. Nothing could be nicer. Oh, you are so kind. But I knew it from the first. Lord Fancourt to Amy. Would you like me to be one of your bridesmaids? They look away embarrassed and sit back on their heels. No. Some other time. Well, now we want you to get his consent. But mine, being a legal affair, you understand, don't you? Oh, yes. Your father's will, you mean? Yes, his consent must be in writing. In writing? And you must get it. Lord Fancourt, blandly. Get it? Yes, you must make him write a letter or something. Oh, but my dears, I've no influence over him. Oh, but you're so clever and kind. And so rich. Oh, yes, and so rich. I remember I gave away half a crown on this morning. At any rate, you must try. Oh, dear Donna Lucia, do say you will try. We are going away. Oh, my darlings, don't leave me. Puts his arms round them. Yes, we're going to Scotland. Scotland? I know. A beautiful country. The whiskey comes from... Movement of surprise from girls. Lord Fancourt takes his arms away. And you are our only hope. Oh, Donna Lucia, have you ever been in love? Oh, yes, dozens of times. Movement of surprise from girls. I mean, uh, once in love, always in love, you know. Kitty rises. Then you know what it means to us, don't you? I should rather think I did. And you'll get his consent for us, won't you? Amy rises. Well, I'll do my best. Kitty goes centre. You can't say no now. Crosses behind Lord Fancourt to Kitty centre. No, not now. Then we'll find Mr. Spettigue. Taking Amy's arm, going right. And send him to you at once. Exeunt Kitty and Amy quickly right. Lord Fancourt rising, going right. Well, here's a deuce of a mess. Enter Brassett from rooms right centre. Slight pause as they catch each other's eye and smile. Oh, I say, Brassett, can you get me a brandy and soda? No, here's old Spedig you coming. Brassett crosses above table and replaces chair beside left table, from down left, taking cushions from chair and placing them in chair at back. Exits into rooms right center. Enter Spedigue left, wearing property top hat with tin lining. Spedigue places hat, crown down, on chair left of table center. To Lord Fancourt. Ah, there you are, dear Donna Lucia. Behind table. I have been looking for you all the afternoon. Enter Donna Lucia, left. I have so much to say to you. Donna Lucia, coming left center. Mr. Spettigue, Mr. Spettigue. Spettigue turns. Will you introduce me? Spettigue aside. How annoying. Why couldn't she have kept away? Aloud. Oh, certainly. Donna Lucia, Mrs. Buttercup Smith, Donna Lucia Dovadores. Goes up left. How do you do? Comes center. They shake hands, meeting center. I'm Charlie's aunt from Brazil. Where the nuts come from. Donna Lucia to Lord Fancourt, smiling. How do you do? Do you know I'm most interested in meeting you? Really? I knew your late husband. Intimately. Enter Charlie right center in archway. Spedigue goes down left. Lord Fancourt turns to fly, but is met by Charlie in arch right center. Donna Lucia crosses down right, smiling wickedly. Charlie stopping him, aside to Lord Fancourt. Whatever the matter, Babs. Lord Fancourt in terror, pointing. She knew my late husband intimately. Dashes across to upper left entrance. Enter Jack up left. Meets Lord Fancourt at upper left entrance. Jack stopping him to Lord Fancourt. Well, how are you getting on? Everything's all right, isn't it? No. She knew my late husband intimately. The deuce. Enter Brassett from rooms with tea, which he puts on table center, and goes to chair upstage. 
Enter Kitty and Amy from left, through arch right center. Meet Charlie there, up right center. Jack, holding Lord Fancourt. Look out. Here's the tea. Well, what of it? Brassett puts chair from up center behind table. Jack, aside to Lord Fancourt. You must entertain. Tucks Lord Fancourt's arm in his, and leads him to table. Aloud, pleasantly, crossing behind Lord Fancourt. Now, don't lose ya. Uh, will you pour out tea? Kitty and Amy cross back to left, followed by Charlie. Stand talking. Charlie center, Amy left, and Kitty right of him. Jack offers chair right of table to Donna Lucia, and stands right of Lord Fancourt center. Oh, certainly. Donna Lucia sits right of table. Spedigue down left, aside. What a cruel interruption! We were getting on so nicely. Do we all take tea? Lord Fancourt neatly pours tea into first cup left, then into one other. Amy takes it, goes down left, gives it to Spedicue. She rejoins Kitty and Charlie up left center. Donna Lucia to Lord Fancourt. You haven't been in England long, have you? Jack rapidly, aside to Lord Fancourt. Change the subject. Lord Fancourt to Donna Lucia. Change the subject. Lord Fancourt deliberately pours tea into Spedicue's hat on chair left of table, very neatly without spilling any, all the time talking over his shoulder to Donna Lucia. Jack, aside to Lord Fancourt. No, uh, do you take sugar and cream? Lord Fancourt to Jack. No, do you take sugar and cream? Jack, aside to Lord Fancourt, losing patience. Ask her if she takes sugar and cream. Nodding towards Donna Lucia. Lord Fancourt to Donna Lucia, aloud. Ask her if she takes sugar and cream. Jack catches sight of tea and hat, and pulls Lord Fancourt's sleeve. General consternation from all except Spedigue, who does not see tea and hat. Lord Fancourt stops pouring tea into hat, and replaces teapot on tray, as Spedigue says, I, uh... Turns, comes left of table, and unconsciously holding cup directly over hat, I think I should like a little sugar and cream, Donna Lucia. Lord Fancourt pours cream into cup, then into hat, talking to Spedigue meanwhile. Spedigue, suddenly discovering tea and hat, puts cup on table and lifts up hat. My hat! My hat! Donna Lucia rises, goes right. Lord Fancourt puts down milk jug, looks apologetically concerned, and takes hat. I beg your pardon. He makes three circular movements with hat, to mix the milk and tea, opens lid of teapot, pours tea back into teapot, again without spilling any, hands hat back to Spedigue. Spedigue takes hat. Lord Fancourt taps bottom of it. Brassett takes hat from Spedigue, who turns away left, wiping eye. Lord Fancourt gaily flips down lid of teapot and sits. Brassett exits to rooms with hat. Sir Francis enters right, joins Donna Lucia down right. Spedigue aside. I must keep her in the humour. I must see her alone. I have it. They must come to dinner. After dinner, that's the time for my purpose. Turning aloud. Pardon me, but I have a little proposition to make. Lord Fancourt rising. Hear, hear. Jack pushes him down again. And I can't take no. Orchestra starts playing very, very softly, same melody as in Act One gradually swells into full volume as the curtain falls. Re-enter Brassett, right center. Sir Francis enters arch right, joins Donna Lucia down right. Brassett announcing. Mr. Spedigue's carriage. Exit Brassett, right center. Ah, capital, the very thing. Now I want you, all of you, to come and stay and dine at my house. Oh, yes, uncle. That will be delightful. How nice of you. Thanks awfully, Land idea. sir. Spedigue to Lord Fancourt. You will return with me in the carriage now, Donna Lucia. Lord Fancourt rises. I can't. It's impossible. I will take no denial. I want you, all of you, to come. Enter Ella, arch right centre. Donna Lucia, down right. I have my niece with me, Miss Stella Hay. Lord Fancourt looks scared, rises. Miss Della Hay. He must get hold of each side of his dress skirt only, without catching up petticoat too, preparatory to throwing skirt overhead later. Bring her. Delighted. 
Lord Fancourt coming centre to Spedigue, unconsciously almost shaking his skirts. No, no, I can't. My things, my things. Turns, meets Ella centre. As Lord Fancourt says, no, no, I can't, Ella starts to speak too. Ella looking up at sound of his voice. Huh, that voice. Running down to centre. It is, it is. Meets Lord Fancourt centre as he turns to meet her. Greatly surprised. Oh. Turns away disappointed to Donna Lucia. No. Music swells to crescendo. Lord Fancourt puts skirt over his head, falls back into Spedigue's arms. Spedigue catches hint. Jack kneels at Lord Fancourt's feet and holds down skirt, hiding feet with hat. Tableau. Curtain. End of Act Two, Part Two.